Hi, I'm Nicole Atkins. Don't be alone with Jay Kogan. Don't be alone with Jay Kogan. Hi, welcome to Don't Be Alone with Jay Kogan. I am Jay Kogan, and you're alone with me. So already you violated the title of the show. I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, the show is about connecting with people. Uh, I connect with people that I'm talking to, but hopefully connecting with you as well. And so I'd love to hear from you. Please uh, write me at dbawjaykogen at gmail.com. That's don't be alone with Jay Kogan at gmail.com. And send me your comments and your questions and uh, questions, uh, life questions that we can ask here on the show. All those things would be very helpful. And uh, I'd love to hear what you think of the show and how you think we can make it better. The show originally uh, was uh, conceived by me. I'm a comedian, writer, uh, comedy writer, just a, a guy, a philosophy uh, student who wanted to talk to people, got tired of the modern life of not connecting with people. And that's the whole point of Don't Be Alone with Jay Kogan is to connect with people. So I hope I'm connecting with you and I'm definitely feeling connected to my guest today, who is Nicole Atkins, one of the great singer songwriters. She is... Um, uh, a very interesting, eclectic person, an artist in the true sense of the word. She responds, vi does visual art, does music. Uh, she's an actress. And uh, as you'll hear, we're considering making a show together. So we'll talk about that. But we'll also really talk about the main thing that I want to talk about is she's one of the busiest people I know. She just is always constantly doing something somewhere uh, at some point. And I feel like I'm busy, but I'm not productive. I feel like I fill my days with things, but at the end of the day, what have I really done? Uh, maybe you have that feeling too, I'm not sure. Uh, in, in the days of COVID, I had filled my days with nothing and felt like I had done nothing. But now that COVID's over, I'm busy doing errands and filling out forms and taking meetings and still at the end of the day, I don't feel like I've really done something. I really wanted to find out how I can make that busy feeling matter more. And we'll talk about that with Nicole right after this. Don't be alone with Jay, Jay Kogan. Nicole, thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, this is great. Uh, Nicole and I were, are, are working together on a TV show. We have a mutual friend, Jim Turner, who mm -hmm. introduced us. And uh, I, I listen to some of her music. She's a great singer songwriter. Your influences are so close to my influences musically. I mean, it seems, I thought, like, well, I should double check. I mean, okay. it seems like, you know, I hear 60s pop music yeah. all over the place. I hear, um, my friend, you know, our my hero Elvis Costello, built in, who has this, much of the same influences. I hear a lot of soul music. I hear, you know, some sort of cool '80s pop music, like pop sensibilities. Golden are all over age it. of radio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I I love your music, and and uh, m several of your tunes have made it to my all time list. I have a list. Really? I, have, I have a playlist. The all time and list. I have an all time list. Yes. Some of your songs are on it. Some of my son's songs are on it. But uh, that's more great. Of, more of Elvis Costello's songs are on it, and more of uh, Frank Sinatra's songs are on it. So I'd say, you know, it's 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 the world. It's world of great music, and nice. so I appreciate I'm your music. Yes, my mom only listens to me and Elvis Presley. Really? Yeah, that's awesome. For like for her whole life. She she. I mean, not saying she shouldn't branch branch out, but there are other people she might like. I know. The only way I can get her to listen to anything new is by putting the CD in her car and leaving it there. Is there a compromise between you and Elvis Presley? Like, is there an artist? That... She likes Nick Cave. Okay, that's she a good She thinks compromise. he reminds her of Neil Diamond and Jesus, and okay. that he should do Broadway. Yeah, Neil... so I don't know if she gets it, but like, she really loves it. Neil Diamond's kind of an interesting compromise between Elvis Presley and you. Yeah. <laughs> There's something there. Yeah. That's that's very good. Um, so thank you for being here. I, I just want, I want to talk a little bit about your road to becoming a... Uh, uh, an artist i would say that you're mainly known for your music but you do a billion things i'm a renaissance man yeah <laughs> you just talked about that you do graphic design that you're cool and you said because you drive what does that mean well i went to school for illustration but i didn't do graphic design in school i was like i'm gonna be a purist and uh but once i started touring like you drive anywhere from like five to 12 hours so there's a lot of time in the car so, so it's, it's more about writing than driving 
it's more about like messing with apps and making right. posters. Right. You so, know, so I, I do a lot of graphic design. I learned how to animate on Procreate, like okay. on the iPad and mm -hmm. it's fun. It's a good way to pass time. I learned how to procreate in cars too. Right. But a different kind of thing. Oh. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but that's awesome. Yeah. That's very cool. I, I, and when we get, get together, you know, you have notebooks and you have things and you actually have notebooks that you designed. Yeah. You not only have notes in notebooks, but you design notebooks. Yeah. Which I think is like a procrastination thing, too. Right. So, I mean, we'll, we'll get to my main question in a second, <laughs> which is has to do with being creative and procrastinating at the same time. But what stimulates you artistically? What is the thing that sort of gets you involved in, you know, again, your voice actor, actor, singer songwriter all that stuff that there's a lot of creative energy coming from you yeah. what's, go what's going on mostly fear of missing out my okay. FOMO is very high right. but um I think it's just I just always loved it ever since I was little like I used to watch Tommy on HBO mm -hmm. when it first came out like my parents were sleeping they were hungover and would just watch Tommy and memorized all the words mm -hmm. wanted to like do it right. and uh you know, did you having, have a crush on Roger Daltrey? No, I I never did. All right, I never have a crush on the main guy. I always have a crush on the side guy. Okay, you know, I think I had a crush on Tina Turner. <laughs> you know, right? But um, but yeah, I just spending a lot of my parents would go to bars and parties, and I'd be tired, and you know, just one more drink, and so I would always just organize all the kids that were stranded there to like do shows. Oh, that's great! You know, pass around the tip hat and. Right. Uh, yeah, my mom said I've been doing the same thing with my life since I was six. So That's, I haven't changed much. Okay. But um, so I have better equipment now. Okay. <laughs> but so that is just your way of being. It's, yeah, it's just always been my way of being. Okay. You know, like if there's a lot of people somewhere, like I bring a sketchbook just in case I don't want to talk. So do, are you one of those rare people who have no stage fright, no anxiety about going out on stage? I thought I did, uh -huh. you know, because I started drinking pretty young. But uh -huh. like when I quit drinking, like I don't have stage fright at all. I think I have like more fright when I'm off stage. Wow. When I'm just home. That's amazing that that you that you thought you had stage fright when you were drink, drinking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people usually drink to get rid of their stage yeah, fright. Yeah, well, when you, when I think you got I just sober, did it first anyway. And I was like, oh, this makes sense because yeah. of, of course I'll have stage fright. Right. You know? That's 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 weird and it's interesting. Totally weird. Yeah, <laughs> that's fascinating. So now so now that you're, you're sober, you just want to perform and you just like yeah. can't wait to do it. And do you ever feel, if you get a unreceptive audience, which sometimes mm -hmm. happens. That's fun. Then what do you do? Yeah, how do you handle that? I talk to them. Okay. And I ask them why they're having such a bad time. Yeah. And, and then they're like, no, that's just my face. And then I'm like, oh, you know, we make them part of the show. Right. But that's one person, you know, like. Yeah. Okay. But usually it's not all of them. No, you know? I guess so. You know, unless you're in Sweden. And then, <laughs> then you know, it's all of them. Yeah. I had a yeah. woman in Sweden come up to the merch booth after and like buy everything. And she's like, that was one of the best shows I've ever seen. And I was like, you could have fooled me. Right. And she was like, oh, you know, I was dancing on the inside. That's great. Yeah. I think I may be Swedish. Yeah. Because I dance on the inside all the time. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm I'm too self-aware to be dancing uh, yeah. too much. It I just, dance sometimes. But. I, the first show, like I used to always dance at shows. And then in 2000, I went and saw The Strokes, like mm -hmm. before they were big, at this like tiny bar called The Five Spot in Philly. And I was like, these guys rip, you know, and I'm like mm -hmm. dancing. And then I look around and everybody's looking at me like I was covered in blood. <laughs> and that's when I first knew what a hipster was. I'm like, right. oh, these are hipsters. Hipsters don't dance. They don't dance. Yes. I was actually talking about right uh, about a block away from uh, from here at the uh, Don't Be Alone with Jake Hogan mm -hmm. Studios. Uh -huh. uh, there's a club that's under construction. Uh -huh. And when I was in high school, it was called the Anti Club. OK. And it was full of hipsters and nobody danced. It was a club. Yeah. And there were music, but people didn't dance. Yeah, because they were anti. Yeah, exactly. We watched. <laughs> Who did you see play there? Oh, uh, people that don't exist anymore. Yeah. It's all right. They're 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 hopefully still alive. But yeah. People may be dead. I'm not sure. <laughs> people may be dead. They may be dead. Uh, but one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show today is because I was struck with this show is about me communicating, talking about my problems. Yeah. And this is one of my problems. I love is, talking about other people's problems. Uh, well, this is good. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I got plenty. Um, I feel as though I'm busy. I'm a busy guy, mm -hmm. but I'm not always productive. Like yeah. I am busy. I have stuff to do from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. Yes. And at the end of the day, I'm not always sure I have anything to show for that day. 
other than you know i i did buy more toilet paper yeah. or something like that well, that's a tiny win yeah i guess so um but it doesn't feel like like had i not bought more toilet paper you would have and spent it. that time no i spent that time doing something important i hear that i feel like oh that would have been better mm -hmm. you know somebody else would have gotten toilet paper i would have stolen toilet paper yeah. something else could happen yeah. if i needed toilet paper but at least i would have done that other thing so but would you have procrastination yeah so sometimes doing things is an act of procrastination yeah and it's and and sometimes it's just the the thing that you're not doing the thing that you're doing instead of the thing you should be doing or maybe that productive thing that's the thing that i want to talk about yeah. so are you doing all the shit that you do to procrastinate or are you <laughs> doing all the stuff that you do to create i think it's 50 50. okay you know like when I, I had to, before I came here to LA to meet with you, I had to write like on my packing list, you know, bring contact lenses, bring chargers, do not bring art supplies because I'm not here to make art. Uh -huh. But I know that if I got, you know, one thing in my brain where like I'm writing this thing and it's not working, I'd be like, ooh, I want to mess around with some like neon orange. And that's procrastination. But sometimes though, those procrastination moments end up being little sellable drawings right you know but well, you i really have to like tell myself like no right you know and part of creating is letting things develop in your mind like yeah. the baking there's a baking period to every totally. good idea or every good thing and sometimes yeah. it's not it's not a matter of just vomiting it out right away sometimes yeah. it's got to bake yeah so it's hard to know whether the orange that you've mm -hmm. set aside is the thing that's going to help you get it done or whether doing coloring with the orange is actually the thing that's going to help you is a better thing to get it done in other words you'll you'll I think it's a nice way to procrastinate rather than just sitting there frozen right. and being like a suck and like talking on the phone Right. Unless you need somebody to talk on the phone with to like right. talk you let you know you don't suck. I feel like talking on the phone doesn't isn't a good form of letting ideas bake because you really no, your you're main engaging. your mind is going somewhere else but like the the reason people get great ideas in the shower or oh, yeah. other things walking is, be, is because they are doing a physical activity mm -hmm. and their brain is centered on that physical activity so the brain is off the problem and onto some physical being mm -hmm. moment and the subconscious is free to sort of think yeah. a little bit. I think that's what people need to remember too. Like the baking period, like that's a good way to not beat yourself up is like if you just remind yourself like, oh, like I'm gardening, but I'm really writing. Right. You know, because it's like something you could do that's physical that doesn't require tons of thought, you know? Right. So, I mean, with the show that we talked about, like right. I let that bake for a year and there were times where I'm like, God, I really need to get it together. But all of the times that I was doing other things, once I sat down, it's like, that's when I got all those ideas. They just weren't all done in one fell swoop. Well, a lot of the show, it's interesting, Nicole and I are working on a show, a lot of the show is based on her life mm -hmm. and it's based on stuff. But the thing about it is you had such a crazy, wild and varied, interesting life that picking out the things that go in the show has yeah. become the problem. Like yeah. the problem is what what to cut away mm -hmm. and what to include. It's yeah. not that there isn't enough stuff, it's that there's so much stuff. It's like songwriting. It's How the same focus? with making an album. Yeah. You know, like when you sit down and make an album, you you're like, shoot, okay, I have four like key songs. So you know you're gonna make an album. But then you have a hundred half finished things. Mm -hmm. And it's like what gets paid attention to. But I think mm -hmm. when, when you give yourself time limits, that's right. always good. For sure. If you give yourself a deadline, it's like everything just kind of hits at the end. I heard Ed Sheeran talk yesterday saying that he goes into the studio, I, I assume a, a songwriting studio, mm -hmm. uh, every day from 10 to, to 6 o'clock every day. Like a business guy. Like a business guy. Yeah. And, he'll, and he'll come out with one song a day. Huh. And it's like, and he That's says, cool. most most of them he throws away. Yeah, most of them aren't good. But he says, like, if if I come up with a great song once a month after doing thirty song or whatever, however many he does, then he's satisfied with that. Yeah, that's not a great batting average. No, it's horrible. Yeah. I would, if I came up with once, if I worked every day and a song every day, and, every and I threw away a month, I threw away. 29 songs yeah. and kept one song. I'd be furious. And it was the one that Ed Sheeran keeps. Yeah, man, I I start washing dishes well there you go <laughs> it's, it's really hard i guess it's hard it's hard it, for i guess my main point it's hard to be ed sheeran 
It is really hard to be Ed Sheeran. <laughs> you have to work really hard to be Ed Sheeran. Yeah. Um, uh, Sad. <laughs> yeah, in, in some way, but happy in others. He mm -hmm. seems to be a happy, happy bloke. He does. Yeah. Did you hear like the thing that he he sends like s giant stone penis sculptures to his friends? Yeah, I heard about that. That I made me kind of like him. Yeah, I like I like him. I, mean, I thought uh, whatever that song that that uh, thinking out loud song's pretty good. It's fine. I don't know it. It's fine. It's a be. It, he got he got a lawsuit because somebody said it oh, was like uh, it was like a Marvin, Marvin Gaye. Gaye song. Let's get it on. Yeah, and it's it is the same bass line, but it's not the same song. Yeah, and I don't know. I don't know. You should be sued for the bass line. I don't know either. Yeah, I, I don't mean, think was so. the bass player paid? For yeah, the, the bass player was paid for but the it's original. Like, oh no, <laughs> that's what that makes me wonder. Player, it's like wait, that bass, no, yeah. that bass player was not paid. But yeah. I mean that that poor chord progression is not unique to no. Marvin Gaye. No. So it's one of the things. It's one of those things where it's like you did a a, a story about two star-crossed lovers. Yeah. It oh, doesn't come belong on. to anybody. Yeah. You know, it belongs to everybody. Yeah. It's all right. Make it three. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, that's that's the modern twist. Make it eight people. Yeah. That's the modern twist. That's yeah. what we would do right now. So how do you focus? You do if you're very busy doing a million things. Uh -huh. When it's time, you put a time limit on yourself. That helps you focus. Yeah. How else can you narrow your focus to actually get shit done? So I I got this here Apple Watch. Okay. <laughs> and um, I set little timers on it just to make it feel not so overwhelming. So I'll set a timer for 15 minutes and then just start. And then I notice that after the 15 minutes is up, I'm in it. Right. But telling myself. It's only 15 minutes. Right. Makes it less daunting. That is a classic uh, productivity uh, hack. Tool, yeah, which is, that I which, was just told about. And I yeah, was like, this is great. Which is great, which is offer yourself a bite-sized doable thing. Yeah. And then do that bite-sized doable thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and for the reason why people like the bite-sized doable thing is because what looms ahead over them like the sword of Damocles is failure yeah and also it just seems too big and it seems like um, like when you have a bunch of ideas that you need to figure out like how to get to the heart of it it seems like a messy room right. and it's like where do you start so if you just set 15 minutes it's like oh you, okay I'm just gonna start over here you don't get too precious about it right and then you usually keep going yeah you know yeah I mean but it's 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 smart to take things a little piece at a time. It's smart to give yourself time limits to work. It's also when you're doing that, you also set aside your self inner critic. Yeah. Because you, it's not about whether it's good or not. It's whether yeah. you're working, doing it or not. Just doing it. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't. It can be shit, and it's yeah. okay if it sucks. It's just I've done the work, and I always feel like if I do that work. I get a sense of satisfaction. Totally, because I mean, that's the thing though you have to tell yourself that you just reminded me of is like telling yourself it can be shit. Right. You know, because especially like for an album, like I put so much pressure on it. It's like, no, this has to be like, th that's why I paint because mm. I don't care. Right. You know, but the song, it's like, oh my God, a fourth grader looks like I wrote this, you know, like, right. but if I did it without any expectations, I wouldn't care. Right. But when you put the expectation, if you can get rid of the expectation, then you're set up to have a productive day. Are you working on an album now? Yeah. And how is that going? It's the messy room. Okay. But the concept is there. All right. Yeah. Now, in 2023 or 2024, whenever this album comes out, yeah. are people still buying albums? My fans are, but okay. you know, they're kind of older, so right. I'm like, shoot. You need to pass on the love of buying vinyl to your children. Right. Um, no, but, but I mean, I'm not even, even in a digital form, do people yeah. care about the the 11 songs? I think the hardcore fans do. Okay. You know, but most people, most people don't. Like I even was out last night and these, I, I ran into some people that I worked with on an album way back in the day. And they were like, so like, do you have any other albums? And like inner me was like, you have fucking three albums, <laughs> you motherfucker. <Right. laughs> but, um, yeah, there are like there are people that care, and I think you know as long as I care. 
Right. Then I don't care if other so, people care. But it's kind of like for me, I, I work in TV and, and yeah. when TV morphs and changes and, you know, in the old days there were variety shows. Those kind of variety shows don't exist anymore. I wish that they me did. Too. I sure do. That's my dream but job. But they don't. And then I worked on sitcoms and sitcoms are kind of dead right now. But mm -hmm. I mean, the multi camera sitcom. Now it's only single cameras kind yeah. of sitcoms, which is fine. But you. I, is that like The Office? Is that a single camera thing? Yeah, anything that looks like a movie is okay. a single camera sit, uh, show. A multi-camera show looks like a play okay. that they filmed. I, I think know, I like the cheers, single camera better. Cheers. Anything that, that with the laugh track with an audience, filmed in yeah. front of an audience is multi-cam. Okay. Uh, even though they do use more than one camera on a single camera show. So yeah. it's a misnomer. But um, the, the idea is that I pride myself in in saying, well, the market has changed, with the bu so I'm going to change with it yeah. and create in the in the form that people are watching now versus the form that people used to watch it. True. So I so I, at some point, whether albums, whether people care about albums conceptually, mm -hmm. like this album, um, you know, eleven songs, they are eleven separate songs, but ideally. They have they some have story, thematic an story mm -hmm. thing that comes with them, and and you can sort of maybe tonally they match somehow. Yeah, they're they're of a piece, and that's the hard thing about putting it together. Right, is that you know you'll have like wait, where does this country song go? Mm -hmm. It doesn't fit, you right. know, and trying to make things fit. But I mean, is that something you say? Oh, I'll, I'll put that on my next country themed album. Yeah, or I'll change it a little bit to make it fit. Right. You know, like I, uh, my uh, two records ago, that record I did, um, Good Night Ronda Lee, mm -hmm. I was trying to make a soul record. Right. But I didn't want it to be like, you know, like soul music that sounded like everybody else's soul music. Right. You know, so I had a bunch of country songs that I'm like, I'm not going to make a country record. And then I just, I was listening to Bobby Blue Bland yep. and just started singing one of my country songs to the groove that he had and it worked. And I was right. like, oh, cool. Yeah. I could put these in any format. Right. You know. Not everything's interchangeable. Not everything is. Right, but I mean... But country music is very interchangeable and it's very easy to write. I guess so. And why is it so easy to write? I think it's just the melody, like this, you know, that standard melody of like, you know, verse, chorus, verse, bridge. I always think country music is almost more about lyrics than about yeah. the music. And so, and usually country music is trying to be funny or smart not mm -hmm. not every country song but a lot yeah. of country a lot of the greatest country songwriters are writing something smart yeah and interesting and sort of like lyrically they're challenging and they sometimes they use quips or puns and totally yeah but uh, and I, I don't hear that a lot in a modern lot of modern lo no. a lot of other kind of music and I drift towards standards and yeah. you know great songwriters, so I like country music for that reason. Yeah, I love old country music, but I don't for that reason. But melodically, you know, sometimes they're more interesting than others. But I, I agree. I guess I guess I agree. if you I mean, slow it down, yeah. it can be soul. Right. Okay. You know, that's the thing. You just slow it down a little bit. Well, there have been lots of songs that have covered by a country artist and also covered by a soul group, and both been hits. Yeah. Many many times. Yeah. So you're. Like Candy State and Stand By Your Man, that's my favorite version. Oh, sure. Yeah. But I mean, there, um, there's that song, I Swear, by, I, I forgot, uh, I swear by the moon Boys and the men. stars up above. Yeah. yeah. It was originally a, a guy named something McDonald who is, it was a country song. Really? Yeah. Huh. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's there's that kind of crossover yeah. from the in the 80s and 90s and even uh, in the 2020s. I, I had a dream one night that I was singing um, November Rain from Guns N' Roses yeah. as like a Conway Twitty duet. Okay. In a castle in the dream. <laughs> but like, <laughs> And so I, I recorded it and I had Mark Lanigan sing on it. But I'm like, wow, all of these hair metal songs from the 80s, like right. they really work as like old school country songs. I, I there, It's interesting that there, I don't think there is... I'm. Of, of an age where there's not a single Guns N' Roses song that hits me in the right spot. Listen to November Rain, our version. Okay. I yeah. <laughs> well, that'll be your version, not uh, not the Guns N' Roses I version. think I just had this argument the other night. Yeah. Somebody else said that about Guns N' Roses. Yeah. There's just so many little parts of things. I'm but, happy to be shown yeah. the magic of something. And sometimes it does take an artist's cover of a song for me to, to really come around to, it. come around to it. Totally. I heard... Um, Thompson's some uh, Richard British, Thompson Richard Thompson's version of a Britney Spears uh, I think it was Hit Me Baby One More Time uh -huh. and his version of it made, I hear his voice in my head now doing that it's made me creepy love it yeah it's like oh this is that's 
fabulous. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, even like with music now, like pop music now, it's so like the vocals are interchangeable because they're so treated. So you can't tell who's singing what mm -hmm. or like, you know, is this Halsey or is this guy? Like, you just don't know. Right. And um, so a Paris Hilton song came on from 07. And the melody, like when I remember when it came out, I'm like, this is dog shit. And then like it came on the other day and I was like, this is melodic, melodically solid compared to what's going on today because right. it's very atonal. Right. So. Right. I, 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 I made me feel old. <laughs> yeah. Uh, get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> get used to it. I am. Uh, it's if you're here for a while and you really care about music, you feel old pretty quickly yeah. because, uh, you know, I grew up in the in the in the 70s and loved me and my i have an enormous record collection at least mm. for me it may be small compared to you but i had I, something like fifteen thousand albums just vinyl albums and then then i when cds came out i started collecting cds and i have thousands of cds yeah and then what about when, tapes did you skip I tapes? cassette tapes but i didn't buy albums on cassette tapes i made mixtapes okay and all that kind of but so i had hundreds of mixtapes and all that kind of stuff and now i have none of it. it's all in storage uh -huh. and i listen to you know my computer and my my phone I th I say you take a like a choice group of the records out. This is a good way to relax, mm -hmm. um, and put them at your house and have like each night will be an album night. Yeah, where you like sit and have dinner at a table and listen to the album. Okay, but that's a good way to do. Isn't it? it? Isn't it? To me, if I had an album night like that, really dedicated it. Yeah, I would think. It's like one of those things, the bite size, it's doable for an album, but I have so many records. Just pick one. That, that pick, of course, but it's like, I'm overwhelmed by yeah. by the amount of choices I have. And so I'll, I'll never do it. Also, what else could I be doing that night? Yeah, or you could have friends over though and like have everybody submit what album they want to listen to. Pick it from a bowl, you pick one each week. Do you listen with friends? Yeah. Really? Yeah, in Brooklyn, we used to have um, record listening night it was a Sunday night thing that this guy Mike did and he would pick an album from like the group and then he'd pick an album because it's his house. Mm -hmm. Two albums were too many, but one album just sitting there and listening to it side A and side B kind of focused. He put some crayons out on the floor and stuff. And what happened at the end? Did you talk about the album? Yeah, we talked about it, but it was also like it was, you know, even though you were doing you were listening to a record it gave me so many ideas and there was like crayons and paper on the floor so i wrote them down while i was listening to the record so yeah. like active listening can really help you yeah because it lets your subconscious go did this guy mike have a lot of great things interesting criticism and commentary on no everybody just talked about how they personally felt just right. by listening to an album it was more about like the individual than like oh i really like the drum sound on the blah 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 but like you say that how they felt that music is very emotional yeah and it does bring up feelings mm -hmm. and so i be it's kind of personal and so listening in a group yeah. to something i might be even afraid of the feelings i got in this group while i listening to the something. lights were low <laughs> so that was good because yeah you do like you feel super vulnerable like hey i'm in a room with like half these people are strangers right. and i hope i don't make a stupid face like right, while i'm exactly. listening to this record right. but once the record started like they picked uh he picked one of my picks was which was uh traffic john barleycorn must die okay and I just remember sitting when I was like in fifth grade listening to that album and I didn't do anything else while I was listening to it. Well, that says the kind of fifth grader you were. You were a fifth grader in 1980 something? No, 1990. Okay, 1990. And, and not I was traffic. Very, not a lot of other fifth graders are listening to, <laughs> not listening to traffic. Yeah, I actually went to buy a new Kids on the Block tape because I wanted to fit in. Right. Okay. And my uncle was like, do you like this stuff? And I was like, no, but everybody does. And right. he was like, you should get this album. You'll like it. Do you like them now, new Kids on the Block? No. Okay. See, that, to me. I mean, I don't it dislike takes, them. It takes time. 20 but, years later, yeah. I can give them a chance and then like them. Like I yeah. wouldn't like them in the moment because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of baggage, sociological baggage tie, tied to certain yeah. uh, artists and you don't want to maybe be perceived as somebody who fits in with any kind of particular group, but time is a great healer of that. So. Yeah, I remember the one time I did like them was when we had a roller skating party. They're great music to roller skate to. Yeah. But yeah. that was it. Yeah, I don't know. They're, they're, uh, I'm trying to, the new, new kids on the block were my least favorite of the boy bands. I just, the idea of a boy band, yeah. I was just like, this is stupid. 
you know, like there's so many, especially when MTV, it was like, yeah. the, you know, there's so many weird, cool characters like on TV. It's like, oh, these guys want a contest in a mall. Right. That just wasn't appealing to me. Yeah. I, you know? I, I, I've always said, and this is absolutely true. I have the musical taste of a 14 year old girl. So uh -huh. I will. There are definitely <laughs> boy band things that yeah. I absolutely love. Okay. New, New Kids on the Block were the least interesting yeah. to me. They seemed like the one the one that they were forcing down my throat, where yeah. the other ones sort of like had more fun. NSYNC had a little bit more fun to them. Yeah. And uh, what was the other one, the, the, the big one that, that uh, played? I want it that way. And uh, Isn't that NSYNC? Oh, Backstreet, no, Boys. Backstreet Boys. I played poker with those guys once. All of them? All uh, five? Just, uh, just like three of them. Okay, yeah. That was great cool. guys, right? Yeah, they were really yeah, nice. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I and like I won twenty five hundred bucks on a slot machine right before my set. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I felt rich. Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. Did you when you were in fifth grade? Big were you time le changed le my life. Loving Led Zeppelin. Nine years old and my brother moved in I have two older half brothers and my 16 year old brother moved in with us he had a waterbed and a wall size Zeppelin poster an ACD ACDC poster right and it just changed my life that's great yeah I, I was his mascot I was not able to listen to Led Zeppelin until I was in my 20s really yep because you didn't like it or? yeah because it also felt they represented something creepy yeah and uh you know I just something gross and so yeah. I couldn't get the grossness out of my head until and, and listen just listen to the music until yeah. much later see I didn't know about the grossness I just like saw the movie the song remains the same mm -hmm. and I was like oh they like wizards yeah. <laughs> and so I was like I like wizards too you know right. it was just like I listened to Led, Led Zeppelin and like went to the mall and bought a bunch of pewter wizards yeah yeah, I know. When I was a kid, it was like you hear about them abusing women and stuff like that. Or with the like, shark meat and yeah, stuff. Like, yeah, I'm like, oh, that's probably not a group I want to. I want to like. Yeah, yeah. I try to. I don't really pay attention to that part. Yeah, I don't. I'm you know now t t again time yeah. separate the artist from the art. I can do that better now. Because at the time, like even like being nine years old and seeing like groupies on you know MTV and like a Bon Jovi video and they all are like yeah and they got like their boobs out and I was just like man those girls look so cool <laughs> you know like okay that's a good reaction but I, I was like fun. I'm gonna have to learn how to play guitar because I'm never gonna look like one of those girls yeah we, you don't want to be the background but girls I either be included yeah I want to be included <laughs> but uh, I think I think that being the background model girl isn't isn't what anybody wants to be no I wasn't like agile enough to like dance on a car so I had yeah, to learn how to play guitar. But I mean, do you think, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe those girls who were dancing on the cars loved it and that's, they would do it in a heartbeat again. Yeah, like, I mean, I've met some women that like have done that like back in the day and they were like, oh, it's a blast. Yeah. And I'm like, you're cool. Yeah, I you don't know. know. Being a, I guess I've never been pretty enough to be that kind of prop. Same. <laughs> so, so it's like, so I don't know what it's like, but yeah. I always feel like uh, there's some kind of usurial you know, bargain about that, that I'm not crazy about. I mean, when I first got interested in boys, like I was 12 and like I found a guitar in my attic and I was like, if I can rip the solo from Heartbreaker, I'm going to get that dude, <laughs> you know? That's an interesting thought because I know that boys learn musical instruments thinking that they can get girls. I'm like a boy. But did you did you really attract a boy by being great at guitar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, things, things changed. All right. But I mean, it's interesting. Um, because it opened the door for me to talk to them. And then they just saw how but that's different. You were like my personality in club. was. <laughs> it, got, it got you to be able to be in the club. Remember the movie um, Some Kind of Wonderful? Yeah. With the girl drummer? Mm -hmm. Like, I saw that movie. I'm like, that's me. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it was always in my head. You know, I was like, oh, he's going to come around after he stops dating the cheerleader and like realize <laughs> right. he loves me. But, you know, usually that didn't happen. Right. But it was really exciting to think about life that way. Sure. Sure. Uh, if you can think about life in only in terms of John Hughes movies, yeah. you'll do well. Yeah. Life will be good. Yeah, I did um, for a long time. So that's that's good. All right. So you're writing an album. You're you're writing this show with me. Uh -huh. You're you know. So do you feel focused these days on those two things? Yeah. Okay. Finally. All right. But uh, yeah, it's it's just everything else. Like you talk about, like even like going to somebody else's show. I'm like, I shouldn't be here. Right. <laughs> you know. And and in the in the world of writing a show that we're writing together, that's a new kind of world for you. Yeah, that was like, I know what I'm doing, but I have no idea what I'm doing. Right. You know, so for a year I could tell every like friends like, hey, what do you think of this? Blah, blah, blah. And they'd laugh and like, they'd be like, that's cool. 
but the physical act of writing it down mm -hmm. like i had like 20 notebooks phone apps like all these right. things everywhere and that was torture like sitting down to like just write the pilot outline mm -hmm. was torture right because i'm in my head going you don't know how to type but like remember, you don't know how to type a paper right so there's know? a critic critical voice in there saying this is not good yeah and but to be fair you don't you don't know what's good or bad no so that's why it's you more like being it. lost in the wilderness a little bit and just like i'm just gonna write a bunch of stuff yeah and then see what it's all about feedback and rewriting and that kind yeah, of stuff yeah I, I didn't even have anybody read it until like i came to see you right mm -hmm. before okay i was like maybe i should have someone <laughs> read this and i said i had my friend uh that came over to the porch and she's laughing as she reads it and i was like that's a good sign yeah. and then i did a lap around the house like yeah. i think she likes it and so that was good most and writers when they give their thing to somebody a comedy thing to somebody and they hear you go they went what's that they yeah, want to know exactly. exactly what would be funny what was funny what yeah. was good but she did it several times good. and then i was like and then another friend came over and he read it and did the same thing and he was like if i didn't know you i would watch this yeah and i was like oh good but also there's this thing which people do when they're reading something and they go Ugh. And yeah. he's like, "Whoa! I don't want to hear that." That's I don't usually my husband. Yeah. Okay. He gives it. it he gives me the 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 real real. You mm -hmm. know. But I I love it because the thing is, if I really believe in something, like I will fight to prove him wrong. Right. And then sometimes he's right. Yeah. You know. So it's great. That was the hardest lesson for me to learn as a creative person, which is I'm wrong sometimes. Yeah, but it's the best lesson yeah. because it frees you from like you know. Yeah, but I thought I was right <laughs> yeah so I really did thought I, was, I thought I was right I thought this is I never think I'm right yeah you know like and un unless it's like something I'll go over a few times and feel comfortable with the person to prove it to them yeah but like everything I do when I give it to somebody I'm like is this bad right is this bad like that'll be my memoir name is that bad no it's not bad <laughs> in in when you're touring and when you're performing and stuff do you does being scattered is being scattered helpful? Like if having a million things to do helpful to then get back to the thing you're doing? In other words, I'm a little ADD, so sometimes- Yeah, I'm ADD too. Uh, it's very helpful to me to have a couple different things going at the same oh, time, yeah. so I can go to this and then go back to this, but it's also poison because then I'm like not doing anything. and yeah. this, this, and this, and this. Well, touring is great because you have a set schedule every day and you have like a common goal at night. You have to perform for an hour and a half right but it's all the stuff before it and after it right but, i mean the stuff i mean the common everybody has to uh have stalkers yeah. uh get to the drug dealer like yeah. uh all the, all the things that people do on tour yeah you know? yeah yeah the drug dealer like Ruin a hotel room yeah yeah no ours is like find the murder motel pray <laughs> that there's no like weird shit in the sheets right. um and that the car doesn't break down yeah do you have control over where you're staying and that kind of stuff? I do. Okay, I, like, good. I book all the hotels because it's right. like free shopping. Right. Okay. You know, like, I take my time with it. I find, like, the best, you know, the nicest amenities for the price we have. Right. And, you, uh, that, that's, a, that's a whole business in and of itself is yeah. to figuring well, out. Well, that's what a tour manager does. Yeah. But I'm like, I would rather save the money on a tour manager than just do it myself because so it's shopping. all that. Yeah. Okay. So you, you're going to get, gather the musicians, gather the, the, the travel plans, figure out where you're going to stay, how you're going to get there, figure out what the house, yeah. uh, which houses, which places you're going to play at. The My agent does okay. that. Okay. And then... Uh, who collects the money? I do. Okay. Yeah. Do you take it in a briefcase full of cash like Chuck Berry? No, but okay. I did have a thing happen in Nashville where this guy was, it was during the pandemic and he was like, hey, uh, you want to do a gig for, and it was like, you know, for four grand and you, it's for my investors at the supermarket. Like he does hotels and he's like, it'll be masked. It'll be, you know, distanced, all this stuff. And he had me and a, another songwriter friend of mine like do it and then he gave us each check for five right. and we were like sweet and it was not masked it was close it was right. horrible but we didn't get covid thankfully and then the check bounced and i was like motherfucker right. can i curse on this yeah okay and uh so the guy had just bought a new hotel and he was like hey uh you know i don't know i think he asked me if i had weed or something mm -hmm. you know like brought him over a joint in a christmas card okay and he was like you know you're the only person that gave me a christmas card this year <laughs> and i was like oh i'm sorry and he goes i want to change and i was like whoa this right. is getting deep and he was like i just want to be somebody who's like shows up somewhere and people are excited to see him 
And I was like, fair. Right. And I was like, yeah, have you ever read that book, The Four Agreements? And uh, he's like, no. And I'm like, well, the first rule in it is always be um, true to your word. And he was like, yeah. And I'm like, so let's practice that right now. Right. Let's go over to your checkbook and you write me a check that won't bounce. Mm -hmm. And it just like, you know, winked at him right. and kind of like jived him. And he was like, all right. And then I get to the bank and they're like, yeah, we can't cash this. And so I call him and I'm like, I'm not leaving this bank. Right. And he's like, oh, it's in trust, whatever. Right. And finally makes it happen. Mm -hmm. But then I have a like a, you know, people around our fire pit in our backyard and my friend that was the other artist mm -hmm. he came with his manager who's in his band and i was like hey did you ever get paid and he was like no and then the manager was like i was trying to shield you from this <laughs> and i was like dude and i told him how i did and i was like he's got a new hotel down the street right. just like roll up with a couple baseball bats be like that looks like five thousand dollars <laughs> with the windows right. what do you want to do right come on right you know so that so he was true to his word briefly for me he was because yeah, right. i told him to yeah that you know like but not a person that people would be excited to see. No. I never thought about it one way or the other, whether people would be excited to see me or not. That's an interesting- I don't think about that either. Yeah. So, I mean, clearly people are unexcited to see him. That's, yeah. that's, that's on his mind. I, I think everybody's pretty unexcited to see me until proven otherwise, and then I'm still suspect. Oh, that's not true. But if I think that way, I'm always pleasantly surprised. But that's not true. Why would you think that? I just, it's just a good- Why do you good, think people it, are gonna be unexcited to see you? It's just a good baseline, because they might have other things going on in their lives. Oh, well, do you think that you bring to the table some fun energy? Oh, totally. Okay, so why, so if you're just walking in the door and saying, hey guys, why do you think people would be unexcited to see Because when they're like, hey Nicole, and I'm like, oh yay, the day's better than I thought it would be. Okay. I set my bar really low. All right, but I mean, that's like, then, then you're just so like, if I don't break my leg, then it's a good day. It's like, I don't know. Kinda. All right. I don't know. I think like, so when I fell in that sinkhole, yes. you know, I fell in an actual okay. real sinkhole. So now to, for the audience to, say, audience to say, people talk about having fallen into a hole in a bad time of their lives. Yeah. And they talk about it metaphorically. You actually fell into a sinkhole. Yeah. I woke up in the bottom of like an eight foot sinkhole. Right. And didn't break anything. So that kind of changed my perspective right. greatly. Like right. the first thing that happened after that um, was... The, our van broke down in Detroit in front of a waste management plant. <laughs> so it just was like shit everywhere, but no one died. The van was going to get fixed. And the drummer was like, you're being very calm about all this. And I'm like, dude, it could have been so much worse. We're fine. Right. So I just don't get too fluffed up about okay. stuff. All right. That's good. I would just, but I would, I think as a friend of yours, mm. I would like to think that you have a better attitude about yourself a better self-image than think uh oh. not but i don't people think people are, are going to be, be unexcited when i walk into a room yeah but I, I mean like in the in the literal term of excited okay you know like if i walked in the room and somebody was like oh my god it's you right. you know like that would be exciting okay yeah but if but, somebody's like what's up right but that's people just but Normal. people, okay, so that's different. But you're okay. You believe people might be happy to see you. I There's don't believe that people would be unhappy to see okay. me. Okay, all right. Except for like two people. Right. But that's their problem. Right. Is it their problem? <laughs> it is. I have them here. They're coming out <laughs> oh, and they'll fuck. tell you exactly why they're unhappy to see you. <laughs> um, so have you helped me uh, figure out how busy? So I feel now like I'm only giving you one tip. I will tell you this, that if you give me, my wife says this all the time. If my wife gives me an assignment. like Okay, what does she give like, you? She'll say, hey, do you mind running to the drugstore for me to get this thing? Yeah. I will. Yes. I will say yeah. absolutely and top of the car. And uh, I would love to do errands mm -hmm. all day long and could do errands all day long. Because it's a real thing. It's yes. a tangible thing. It's a Here's like, the job. I get it done. And I feel a sense of accomplishment yeah. to having gotten that thing done. Mm -hmm. But. Which is different. It's very low. It's you know the 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 accomplishment of it is a very low bar. That's yeah. like it doesn't. It's not the same as I finished a script or I've written a song or yeah. I've performed or I've you know helped a charity or something yeah. else. There's lots. The sense of satisfaction I can get from doing other things would be much higher. Totally. I think I keep a lot of lists, and that really helps me. So it's like for the week if you look at like the if you plan your week mm -hmm. every sunday is like my journal night okay so it's like tv night and journal and what do you do in the journal on the sunday i just night? make three things that i want to accomplish that week okay and even if it's like not finishing a song but organizing all the songs i've started into mm -hmm. a list okay that's that's a win 
Okay, so this Sunday night, I would go to the journal and say, I have to get a journal. That would be my first thing. Well, while you're running journal. errands for your wife at the <laughs> drugstore, pick yourself up a journal. Right. I know I'm bad with journals. I used to journal. I used to do that, uh, write like an artist thing. Uh -huh. and, so, and I would journal every day, three pages. It was like five pages a day. Yeah, like the artist way. Artist way, exactly. Yeah. And just like spill out stuff. And I felt really, ultimately, very unproductive after the end of that too yeah like <laughs> I, I did that too i spent so much time writing in journals like don't stop write all your thoughts and i did all the and i did it every day and then i yeah. felt like well what have i got yeah this, this is not helping me it doesn't help me create i find that just like going through like your day and living life and just writing things down in the journal randomly right. Because those are things that you write down that pique your interest, right? Enough to write them down. Well, I have that. I, I do write that on my That's phone. The journal. I have a phone as my journal. Yeah, so yeah, I, I do just, the same. Yeah, but then like if I put it in my like written journal, that's commitment. So it's like the the ideas are in the phone, and the ones you want to keep are in the journal. Uh, I have a totally separate question. That's t t totally. Uh, this is just a question. Uh, a period of a show we call Question Time. Okay. And there's a theme. Question Time. It's Question Time. That that could be the theme. Yeah. Char uh, char <laughs> my 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 son has written a theme for Question Time, but that's a good one too. Um, <laughs> the question I have for you, since you've met so many great artist through being an artist uh -huh. who's the coolest people that you've met oh okay uh coolest people that i've met yeah, kind of like dream come true you say they don't meet your heroes yeah but you've met a few heroes nick and they... cave nick cave okay. was a total sweetheart right and really nice i remember being so afraid to like what are we gonna do when we meet nick cave right. you know and then the first show like i'm outside smoking and this guy's like do you have a light and i was like there he is it's mm. happening now mm. and he was just so sweet yeah like made me a smoothie okay and like spun me around when i was like lost in the masonic temple like really sweet and his right. whole crew looked like terrifying people that will kill you <laughs> right and they were all teddy bears oh, and like nice. me and the drum tech would do drawings together and uh we bought them all hot sauce from buffalo why do you think nice people dress like they're terrifying horrible people um Maybe because they're lazy. I don't know. Like, <laughs> no, but I mean, there's a there's a vibe and a look of people who look like they're I don't know if it's a dressing thing. It's more of a face thing. Oh, I see. You know, it's like I got a big long beard mm -hmm. and I have like eyes that are very like focused and almost right. mean seeming. Mean sad eyes. You know, it's a defense mechanism so you can get your work done because okay. usually crew people have to be there from morning to night. They right. have the you know the hardest job of anybody. I think even harder than anything. Yeah, crew's and, being very, very, very tough. Yeah, they're, they're the first out of bed and the last to be Which in is it. Why people don't always last in those positions? But yeah, no, just, I mean my husband's a crew person, and yeah. I'm just like, I hope you live a long time mm -hmm. because you are just running on empty all yeah. the time. But uh, yeah, so, I, so, I find so that Nick Cave was Nick Cave, Nick was, Cave the, was, was the greatest sort of he was, happy happy meeting. Yeah, I mean Elvis Costello too. Right. It's it's funny because the people that you hear that can be like very sharp tongued, they're usually the nicest. It's the people that are like, oh girl, I want to lay you down on a bed of roses mm -hmm. or some shit like that. Those are the people that might like chop you up and put you in their basement. Right, but that's in sync. And you said you, they were very nice. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, that was Backstreet Boys. Oh, Backstreet Boys. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I don't know in sync. Yeah, no, I, but I, we were playing poker, so like it was nice enough. Yeah, I know um, uh, Joey Fatone and Lance Bass. Okay, they seem, very they nice. seem very nice. They're very nice. Joey yes. Fatone is a nice Italian boy. Yes. Yeah. They call him the fat one. It's spelled yeah. fat one. They still he's he's adorable. I want to hang out with the fat yeah, one. He's good. Yeah. He's good. I've had good experiences meeting my heroes and then really shitty experiences meeting my heroes. And none of them is the fault of anybody else but me. Uh, a lot of it's with the baggage I bring to the to yeah. to that conversation. The conversation that can't happen. Probably the conversation you didn't have with Elvis Costello, which is you're working with Elvis Costello, so it was easy to just hang around. But we weren't working together when we first met. Right. You know, like when we first met, I had a weird week of like him just popping up in conversation. And I'm like, what does this mean? It means I need to sing with him. And I'm like, what am I talking about? And then he shows up in my dressing room. Great voice. And I'm like, okay, we need to talk. Right. But he, that's the, that's the, 
the glorious way to meet Elvis Costello That's what is LA somebody people coming would call manifesting. Yeah, is <laughs> coming to you to say you are cool. Yeah. Like if you if Elvis Costello came to me to tell me I'm cool, then everything would be fine. You should be like, I know. I'm so <laughs> glad you finally see it. Uh, because the only interaction I've had with Elvis Costello, well, I've had a few, but many interactions, and all of them sort of hover around me either saying or decidedly not saying you're great and your music's great and I, it's meant so much to me like that yeah the kind of one-way interaction that he, there is no response to yeah that's nothing elvis costello can say if somebody says that other than well, thank you i'm glad you enjoyed it but it doesn't open a conversation yeah it's the conversation ender yeah and so i've done both i've done i've i've completely ignored elvis costello and just you know talked about the room we're in or whatever yeah. and other times i've come to him said like a drooling fan and you're so fantastic. Neither one were great. Yeah. So For I me, know. like musicians are just easy to talk to because I am one, right. you know, so it doesn't seem like, ooh, what are you going to talk about? Yeah. You know, but well, when I meet well, you like guys talk about picks, actors picks and, and comedians, I'm like, narf. Like, yeah. I remember meeting Jermaine from, uh, from the Flight, Flight of, of Concords. Concords. Yeah. Super nice guy. Mm -hmm. But like anybody that can do comedy and music, that's amazing to me. Like, right. that's just so cool. Right. And the only thing I could say to him was, he was like, oh, I liked your song tonight. And I'm like, thanks. New Zealand's really far away. <laughs> and then I got in my Uber and I'm like, stupid. <laughs> All right. So here's another question for question time. Okay. This is a randomized question that's from a list. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to pick a letter between A through uh, G. That's it. And a number between 1 and 18. Okay. G14. All right. The question at G14 is, uh, getting there? Oh, it is. <laughs> this is a big question. Okay. okay. All right. But you have to answer it as uh, best of your ability. Okay. Why do we exist in this particular universe? Oh, I know the answer. Okay. To find out more about love and to party. Okay. That's what this universe is about. Yeah. Okay. That's All it. Right. And are they the same thing? Partying and finding out yeah. about love? Yeah. Okay. Because when, yeah, when you find out more about love, you feel better and you're able to party more. Okay. And what have you found out about love so far? Um, that there's lots of different forms of love, you know, and there's love in everything. What's the, what's the strangest form of love that you've found thus far? Oh, gosh. Strangest form of love. I mean, yeah. Self-love. Okay. That's been the strangest thing. All right. Interesting. Have you learned to love yourself pretty well? I'm learning to... Uh, yeah to uh be nicer to myself okay and to and to like be appreciative of the thing like i feel like if i don't dig what i'm doing no one else is going to dig it so right so what what are you loving about yourself now that maybe you didn't love 10 years ago i mean my hair obviously <laughs> <laughs> My, I was going to say everybody here was talking about how they love your it's hair it's really great hair yeah, yeah. All right. um my nose never loved my nose so that was I the thing like now. physically you were you were worried about your physicality well my grandmother would always be like you know when i die i'm gonna leave you two grand to fix your nose and i'd be like what's wrong with my nose right. you know so you didn't love your you didn't have a problem with your nose until grandma started criticizing your nose and then you worried about it well it was grandma and most of the people in my school and uh that's the thing they picked on you about oh, was it was your weird. Nose? yeah you know it's messed up i went to catholic school and their like mean nickname for me was Anne frank Wow. And I was just like, you guys are fucked up. <laughs> so it didn't even make me feel bad. It right. just made me know I was like in a room of tyrants, you know? Because they, your nose was a Jewish nose? Is that why? My nose is an Italian nose, but it looks Jewish, but who cares? Okay, but I'm saying like, that's the Anne Frank of it all. It's not yeah. like you should be buried in, a, in an attic somewhere. No. Okay, all right. I, <laughs> like, I want to get the full measure of the insult. A very like racist, you okay. know, so Irish Catholic school. Yeah, anti-Semitic. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm I'm used to that. That's fine. yeah, but uh, um, but yeah, even even just uh, my disorganization, I've learned to kind of accept that because like in a pinch, I can MacGyver the shit out of anything, right? Because of all of the random shit I have around me, you know. So, so if something breaks. So in an I can emergency, fix it. in I'm an emergency, awesome in an emergency, you go to you. Yeah. But in normal times, in calm times, yeah. don't go to me. Don't to you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So working with you, I should create little emergencies. Yeah. Okay. Now I know something. If you got this problems, is... I got solutions. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. That's very good to know. Um, now uh, we've we've asked a few questions. I'm going to go to the next question uh, part of our show, which is called listener mail. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Now it's time for. Listener mail. 
So here's it. This is a real question from a real viewer. You should use that. You've got mail. Th thing. There's another podcast that uses that. Really? Yes. There's another podcast. There's a woman named Kira Swisher, who's a big deal podcaster. And I listen to her podcast and they do like a thing. But da, 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 you've got mail. What if you put it in like a demon voice? You've got mail. You've got mail. We could do that. We could do that. But then <laughs> we have to do that as part of the listener mail theme. And yeah. Put it on top. Yeah, sure. If I got somebody who would do my music that was willing to do uh, put more work in it than the two seconds my son put into it. Tell your son fine. you're not going to feed him. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, he does. To be fair, I paid him nothing. So yeah. what I got was free music yeah. for nothing. And that's great. Other than bringing him up. Uh, no. Life. Fathers, parents owe their children. Children owe their parents nothing. Really? Yeah. See, I had to make all, I had to do a lot of stuff for my parents. You didn't have to. I did though. Because my parents are also Sicilian and very big on guilt. I understand, but, you, so, but there are kids who go say, no, yeah, I'm done. Not me. Yeah, not you, but I'm yeah. mean, saying like- Every Super Bowl Sunday, I had to make all like the football posters right. for them. And if you- That was my contribution to the family. If you didn't make the football posters for your mom and dad- I'd be a piece of shit. No, <laughs> you wouldn't. You'd be fine. And the, the world wouldn't judge you. But if your parents starved you and didn't, that would be a crime. Yes. They didn't do that. Right. I just, you I'm know. I'm just saying that the parents owe children and children don't necessarily owe their parents. They can do for their parents if they yeah. want to, but it's a one way, it's absolutely, they didn't ask to be born. Parents created that person. Man, I can't think that way though. I, right. I have a friend that she always tells her mom, I didn't ask for this. And I'm like, yeah. oh my God, I'm like. I don't think that way either. I'm, I do a lot for my parents, yeah. but I know do it knowing that it's choice. Yeah. Not not a responsibility or an obligation or that's it's a choice i feel like i'm making up for lost time though because yeah. when i used to drink i used to just oh my god yeah now i like make the bed with care when i come to visit oh that's very nice because i'm like paying them back for lots of lost time so here's the question What's and this can uh, uh from a viewer named joey joey and joey and he said uh it's a listener okay. Wait, this is a podcast so it's a listener named joey okay all right and he says um where does your life fulfillment come from in terms of writing? Is it being able to earn a living, living a creative lifestyle, or both? How has fulfillment and its meaning changed over the years? So that's a Ooh, fascinating question. That is, that's a great question. So as a as a writer, you're a writer. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, let's start with that. Does does your life fulfillment come from come in terms of writing? Is it being able to earn a living, or is it the doing anything creative? Yeah. Well able to earn a living or success, mm -hmm. you know, like lucrative, mm -hmm. able to earn, like if I wasn't able to feed myself, mm -hmm. things would be different, right. you know, but on the level that I am, I'm able to feed myself. Mm -hmm. So, but for writing, like before I would put a lot of, but actually like when I did my first record, I didn't put pressure on myself because it was my first. And then when, you know, awareness came and success came i put a lot of pressure on myself and that stopped me from creating and now i feel like i've had this perception shift where it's like i haven't had to have another job in 15 years which is great that's amazing and i see a lot of friends of mine having bigger stages bigger audiences but i still don't have to work at you know like i don't have to go back to school or right you know, um, go work in a paralegal office. Right. But so that is success. Get, get to work in a paralegal office. Yes. That's, that's a pretty sweet job. It was a horrible job. <laughs> I did right. it once. All right. Um, but that if I have something to write about that makes me excited, mm -hmm. that's the win, you know, because that's the only thing I can control is how I feel about the work, okay. how I feel about doing the work. But we've also just been talking about how hard it is sometimes to do the work. But I think it's more of when I have the idea. Yeah. If I have an idea that makes me want to do the work, even right. though I might procrastinate right. doing it, that's an exciting thing because I have a purpose. Well, let's talk about that because that's a fascinating point. When you have an idea that gets you excited right on, that is the perfect moment of excitement mm -hmm. because the idea is anything. It's it's, it's idyllic, it's perfect. Yeah. And, it, and the more you... Uh, put flesh on that idea the shittier it becomes yeah and the more you out of love with it you fall and you have to sort of go through this period of like the bad relationship with the idea mm -hmm. for a little while until 
you get to a place where you can start rewriting it and fixing it and then fixing that relationship and it come back closer to that moment of falling oh, in love oh, with oh it. Oh my God, I have this idea. Right. Yeah. But, and it's almost, it's like, it's a lot like music. Yeah. It's a lot like you have the idea, you write the song, you go into the studio, record it, and then you realize, oh my God, those lyrics are shit. So you rewrite them and then you mix the song and then you're like, holy crap, this doesn't need a bridge. You take it out. So it's like editing, you know, but people it's get scared of that moment when they start falling in love, falling out of love with the idea of thinking this is a bad idea. I should I should change. Yeah. And instead of what they should be feeling, which is no, no, you're just going through a very normal creative process. Totally. And then, so, the, so the question about whether fulfillment comes from writing, eventually it does. When you have yeah. this great idea, t that's great. When you're finished writing the great idea and it comes out pretty good, that's also yeah, great. Yeah, because you, you actually did it. Because you did you it. You did the task. But there's a lot of shit in between those two moments that yeah. aren't really fulfilling yet. And I think, though, that you can only get to that awareness by doing it a lot. Right. You know, like... What I, when I make an album, I go through these deep bouts of depression and self doubt, and but now I remember, you know. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, this is just what you do. The same thing happens to me. When Aaron, anytime you make an album, I go through deep depression and self doubt. <laughs> yeah, and it's very. I don't know why. I just feel very connected to your music. I guess. Yeah, I'm all glad. Right. I'm glad it's, you could feel that. Yeah, it's but all like, right. It, you know, my husband will even know. He's like, you're writing a record, aren't you? And I'm like, why? Because I'm being miserable and crazy. And he's like, yeah. So, well, do you do you get miserable and crazy in that moment? Is that is that what's yeah, going on? Yeah, almost manic. All right, you know where like I can't even sleep because every little idea is like an idea. Yeah. Like So it's just having to turn it off. Well, good. I I I think I'm I'm excited for your next album. I'm yeah. excited for the the things that we're working on. It's it's nice to be around somebody who feels creative and full of energy. Yeah, and that's kind of a a, a great thing so thank you for for giving that to me cool that's really awesome yay yeah yeah because i mean it's all like that you know creative work is the best thing ever and yeah. it's like if you get to do it that it's just play yeah like my mom said you've been doing the same shit since you were six like that's the goal yeah even though i met like i went and taught at this retreat like how to look at art like an artist but all these people were in finance and they're like you're so lucky you know, we came here because we want to like get back in touch with our, you know, inner children. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I would love you to teach me like, what's a 401k? Right. Like what? Right. You're very familiar with the inner, with the inner child that you want to just yeah. life hacks. to just I have actually, no you know. idea. Like I'm still thinking like when the shit goes down, I can go to Key West and open a lemonade stand and sure. play songs for tips. There's also good things about not being six years old too. So that's the other stuff. Just yeah. keeping the imagination in front of a six year old, but not eating corn dogs every day yeah. is also pretty Only good. like once or twice a week. Yeah, that's you fine. Know? Limit, and being able to drive. Limit corn, corn dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, go to any movie. Yeah. No, the R rating's not a problem. Uh huh. That's pretty good. I remember when I turned 17, I missed my, my family had a birthday party for me, but they didn't tell me about it. So I was like, oh, that's nothing's weird. happening. Totally well, weird. Not a surprise party. No, just they a do this all the time. Okay. They'll be like, we made all these plans. I'm like, but no one told me. Right. So it was, Striptease was out when I turned 17 and it was NC-17. Sure. And we were all like, we got to go see Jesse Scooter from Saved by the Bell. Uh -huh. And it was such a big deal. Yeah. NC-17. And how'd it work out? It was a horrible movie, but really funny. Right. And then I got to my house and my parents were mad because okay. there was a cake on the table. All right. I well, there. I mean, yeah, they got to take some responsibility for that. I, yeah. See, this is why you don't owe them necessarily everything. They, they're, you know, family's hard. It's hard. Relationships are hard. People all that kind are, of stuff. Uh, humans are really People difficult. People are humans, but, uh, yeah. my, you know, but, but uh, they, communication, communication helps. Yeah. Communication helps. Yeah. Uh, which is the whole reason of Don't Be Alone with Jake Hogan. It's about communication. I mean, it, that's the whole reason for art, too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Although Just, it's kind of a weird form of communication. Well, it's very um, one sided. Right. Well, it, each collaboration side, is both great have for one that. side. The interpretation of your art is completely one sided. Yeah. And the art that you put out is completely one sided. And artists refuse to talk about the meaning of their art. So it's it's everyone's like in the dark. I like talking about the meaning well, of my art. Well, then you're not an artist. I'm just erasing really? it. No, I, I, I find that a lot of people don't want to put, don't want to disturb the interpretation. Yeah. So they'll just let people think. It is what it is. Yeah, you know that's it's okay if um, if the, if hey Jude, 
is about people want to think hey jude is about one thing when it may be about paul mccartney's mom and, and yeah. brother and stuff well you like tell that. the things that you want to tell yeah you know but i i think that the story of how a song came together or how an album came together like that's the kind of stuff i would watch on tv me too i like it but i'm also saying that 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 my a song fly me to the moon frank mm-hmm. sinatra's count basie's version of fly me to the moon yeah i don't want to hear ultimately what count basie was thinking and what frank sinatra was thinking because i hear such joy yeah in it that i just i want to i, I want to know though i'm floating on that song and if there's a reason i shouldn't be floating on it i don't want to hear about it you want to hear a story though that makes my like hair on my sure. arms stand up so spooner oldham from uh muscle shoals he was a mm-hmm. franklin's keyboard player and he played on my although uh, she played pretty mean keyboards herself she did yeah she did uh, his his style is wurlitzer do you know that stop me for a second? Yeah. Aretha Franklin yelled at me once. Really? Just saying. That's it. awesome. Yes. She screamed at me because I put Diet Coke, I put a can of Diet Coke on her, on her piano. And fair enough. Yeah. No, Coke soda does not belong on her beautiful piano. Yeah, yeah. I would love it if she yelled at me. She did yell at me, but keep going. Um, So she, uh, or Spooner Oldham, he told me the story. He was in uh, New York City. He was 16 years old probably for some Aretha thing in a bar and sees this old man with this hot young blonde. And he's like, who's that? And they're like, oh, that's Hoagie Carmichael. And he's like, oh, I always wanted to know what he wrote Stardust about. Right. Because it makes me feel something that's very sad, but it's just so beautiful. So he asks him and he goes, well, when my wife died, I rented a plane and I took her ashes up into the sky and let them out into the sky. And I wrote Stardust just came to me. Oh, that's amazing. And I was like, yes. Wow. like." That's I a great know story. Those stories. That's a great story. Mm-hmm. But that enhances the song. See, yeah. that's I want the stories that enhance the song are great, but the ones that are terrible yeah. that don't enhance the song, I don't want to hear. But and that's you the thing about and being you can't an artist. Ask first. You like you make it up. You, uh, you know. All right. All it's right. like what the song is about, but then what do you want to say to the people that it's about? Yeah. It's totally different. Well, Nicole, it's time to end this thing. I thank you so much for yeah. being here. You're awesome. This is such a bright, beautiful podcasting studio. I, well, it's, you know, it's, it's really uh, delightful. For you know, I've been doing podcasts for 25 years, wow. and this has been. We built the studio, the penthouse. Uh, yes, all the it, money it, has gone to is. charity and building this penthouse. So I'm glad you you like it. I love it. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here, and I look forward to hearing your next album and and continuing working with you. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's so fun. All right, and uh, thank you, the audience, for listening to Don't Be Alone with Jay Kogan. Please uh, feel free to write in to uh, D B A W J A Y K O G E N at gmail.com with any questions or comments. Uh, tell me what I'm doing right and tell me what I'm doing wrong. I would say that email address again. <laughs> uh, d- don't be alone. It's don't be alone oh, with Jake Hogan. DBA. D-B-A-W J-A-Y-K-O-G-E-N. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, at gmail.com. Uh, anyway, thanks for being here and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>